Oh, look at that. It's almost perfectly lined up. Nothing else is. <laughs> That's okay. <clears throat> so just like before, we can do area by integrating a height one uh, function over the region. So we can do the same thing with polar coordinates. So area of region R and polar coordinates is, all I'm going to do is replace the function, what I underlined, with the number 1. So nothing monumental, just literally running 1 instead of that function. So it's a double integral over R, 1, R, dr, d theta. So don't forget about the extra R that sneaks in. Very important. You don't need to write the one if you don't want to. You can just leave it as r dr d theta. So the formulas are pretty straightforward. One of the more difficult things is to figure out what your region actually is. So we'll do an example right now. And so given the region mounted by, so I'm going to specify the outside, r is 1 plus cos theta. and inside by r equals 1. Uh, so let's set up the integral for the area of this region. And we'll call it r like we've been doing. So you could graph this function, 1 plus cos theta, but that's going to take a while. To do it properly, we have to plug in some values and then graph it on polar grid. So instead of, uh, you can easily graph r equals 1. That takes two seconds. The other one is a little more tricky. Let's instead set up a inequality. So our radius is supposed to be so this, what I just underlined, that curve is outside our region. And the one that I squiggle underlined, that's the inside bound of our region. So we want R to be greater than or equal to 1 and less or equal to 1 plus cos theta. So R is between these two. <coughs> so we need to figure out what theta values, let's see, so the bounds we're going to intersect, the r equals 1 and r equals 1 plus cos theta. So we're going to set them equal to each other. You can start with r equals r. So go 1 equals 1 plus cos theta, subtract 1. 0 equals cosine theta. So we have infinite solutions. If we think on a unit circle, cos theta is 0, cosine is the x coordinate, so there's two solutions at top and bottom of the unit circle. So we get pi over 2. <coughs> Luckily, all we have to do is add a pi, and we'll get every single solution. So there's our intersection. All right, so we just integrate across an infinite number of endpoints, and we're good to go. No, we can't do that. We need two endpoints. 
So the question is, should we go from negative pi over 2 up to positive pi over 2? Should we go positive pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2? We have to figure out where to go. All right. So it's pretty obvious we're starting and ending at one of those two and then ending at the other one. We just have to figure out which one are we starting at, which one are we ending at. That's where the inequality comes in. So let's figure out, let's graph in uh, rectangular coordinates. So we're going to let y equal 1 or y equal to 1 plus cos, whoa, cos x. And I want to know where do these two intersect. Maybe these are bad letters. We'll go with f of x and g of x. So it's easy to graph f of x equals 1. There it is. So that's 1 right there. So that's the horizontal line f of x right there. Now cos x plus 1, that's cosine function, but it shifted up 1. So cosine starts normally at 1. We're going to start this one up at 2. And then it goes, ends at 2. In the middle is pi. 2 pi. That is g of x is 1 plus cos x. So I'm just taking the two functions, a little bit weird, I'm graphing them in rectangular coordinates. I'm doing this because it's easy to graph in rectangular coordinates. All right, when is f less than or equal to g? So I better be a little more careful, so I need pi over 2. So when is f? So between pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, which function's on top? f or g? f. So I want to know when is f less than g. So I specifically don't want that region right there, because the functions are in the wrong order. Does that make sense? We got f on the top, g on the bottom. Uh, just re let me switch to. Ooh, takes good for this. So we got f here, g is down there, so f is above g. That's not good. So we don't want that region. That's out. So we'll draw the cosine function out a little further. Ah, this is like a really nice interval right here. So that's negative pi over 2. And relabeling now, g is on the top and f is on the bottom. So now I could say in this interval right here, we have the property that g is, uh, or f is less than or equal to g. So I'm going to go negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So that interval is out, and we're going to go with that interval right there. So any questions about intersecting is sort of the easy part. I mean, it's a little bit of algebra skill, but figuring out between which two values do I go between. Now, I could have extended this over further, and it would have been completely OK to use that interval also, to go 3 pi over 2 to whatever 5 pi over 2 after that. So you have a choice. Uh, what you don't want to do is choose the in-between part. That's not a good choice. They're the wrong order. Now, if you get this wrong, you will, what will be happening? You will be getting the area of the wrong uh, region, basically. Not necessarily the negative area. Because I'm not swapping endpoints, I'm actually, instead of going negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, I'm going pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. That's not swapping endpoints, that's making completely different ones. So I get the wrong area. So we're going to go negative pi over 2 to pi over 2.
There's another way to do this. If you plug in a value between two of these, you could figure out which functions on top, which functions on bottom without graphing. So I could have picked, for example, 0. I could have chosen 0 and pi and plugged in 0 and see which function is greater or less than with 0. And I would figure out that, yes, f is indeed less than g at 0. So I can go from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2 on that side. So that's another way to do it. So there are lots of ways to figure out. Well, there's really two main ways to figure this out. Plug in points or make a graph. A lot of people are just staring. Does that, does that make sense? OK. So when you have access to other tools, you can, of course, do a polar graph. And then depending on what tool you have, you could just ask, hey, what's that intersection? What's that intersection? And then you can answer very easily. But if you, that's a good way to check, not a good way to get the answer. All right, now we know our start and end values right there. So we can set up our area. So I'm just going to copy down what we have. We have a region R, R, dr, d theta. <coughs> the polar order of integration is basically already set. If you change around the order, you've got to be very careful when you do it. You generally are not going to change around the order. So we'll leave some space. So what is the outside? The outside, are these r's or thetas? Those will be thetas. So don't think in terms of left and right. Think in terms of insides and outsides, because that's the way these work. It doesn't really matter what's on the left. It's really inside and outside. So we've got thetas, r's. R, dr, d theta. <laughs> All right, I think it's easier to fill in the thetas. So let's do that. They're numbers. Your out bounds, your outside bounds better always be numbers. Or something weird is happening. You probably made a mistake if they didn't, if they're not numbers. So any guesses on what little r might be? Why do you say 1? Because the inequality right up here. It's got to be bigger than 1 and smaller than 1 plus cos theta. So we go from 1 to 1 plus cos theta. This integral doesn't look very fun. Because it's about to be r squared over 2. And then we're going to plug in that thing squared. <laughs> so let's just call it a day right here. I just had set it up anyways. All right, so that will be the area right there. We're going to look at changing from rectangular to polar. Uh, we'll leave the order just dx, dy. That's really just da. All right, how, what are the coordinate uh, changing equations that we use to go from rectangular to polar? Squared plus x squared plus y squared. So we got the x squared plus y squared is r squared. We got the theta, the uh, tangent theta. Okay. X equals mm. cos theta, y equals r sine theta. There we go. R sine theta. I think we did this part already. Uh, now I'm going to take the differential operator at both of these. Uh, well, first of all, let's go ahead and plug in the values that we have. So f is not eating x, it's now going to eat the polar coordinate version of x, which is r cos theta. We're making a substitution here. So x is r cos theta, y is r sine theta. 
So I'm just literally changing x for r cos theta and y for r sine theta. So no calculus so far. However, dx dy, that's going to change around. So let's figure out, because I'm tight, what is dx? So we have a product rule going on. So it's going to be derivative of r is 1 dr plus one dr plus r derivative of cosine is sine negative sine ooh negative sine it's all right would that be one dr cos theta yeah uh, oh yeah wow minus r cos to sine theta d theta? Uh, that seems right. True to r is dr cos theta sine d theta. That seems good. dy, another product rule, almost the exact same thing. 1 dr times sine theta. We get a plus here. Plus r derivative sine theta cos theta d theta. So any derivative questions right there? It should feel a lot like implicit differentiation. It's basically implicit differentiation. You're just not. Uh, having a divided by dt, basically. That's the only real difference. All right, so multiply them together and see what you get. Hopefully things cancel, it looks nice. This is not what I want. We did this the other day and it worked out just fine. Somewhere. Was it in this section? So we did this geometrically up here.
So we're supposed to get dx dy equals r uh, dr d theta is what we should be getting. I don't see that happening here. Yeah, if it was plus there, we'd be fine. Yeah. And if the first term didn't exist at all, the first two terms were erased, we'd be good to go. Zero because the differential squared. I'm thinking there may be something. So there's a geometrical argument you could make. And saying that's DA right there. So we did compute that at the top. Or at the one of the first things. Somewhere. The AK, that right there. I don't think I said it here, but this oh, there it is. That's the area of the rectangular subdivision right there. So that's one of the first things that we worked out in this section. So using that geometrical property, we can say that dA, the area of that small wedge shape, is r d r d theta. Are we supposed to have that extra r in this as well? Yes. A better. Yep. Yeah, you get the extra r. All right, so I'm going to get you started on a problem and then look up where I went wrong here. So we have to get some bounds here. And that can take a little bit of effort to get some bounds. I don't want to spend all the time to graph this, because that takes 10 minutes or so. I'm worried that if we don't graph it, we're going to skip over something, though. All right, so let's go ahead and graph then. We have some time to kill. All right, do you remember how to graph polars and polars? Find symmetry first, which can be difficult. Plot a bunch of points, and then use your symmetry and graph the rest. So we're going to use symmetry. So I'll do the x-axis test. You're going to replace theta with, no, with negative theta. So we pass x-axis symmetry pretty quickly. 
or I should say painlessly. But it's x-axis symmetry. We'll try y-axis. This one is replace theta with pi minus theta. So before we can use the sum rule, we have to distribute the two. And now you need to remember the difference formula for cosine, which is cos 2 pi cos 2 theta plus sine 2 pi sine 2 theta. All right, what is cosine 2 pi? Positive 1, so we get cos 2 theta. And what is sine 2 pi? Zero. All right, so we get four cos two theta. All right, so we get x-axis and y-axis symmetry. That's a lot of symmetries. So there's a rule we cannot have two symmetries. So we'd have to get origin as well, unless we made a mistake here. So we get origin for free. Now we graph. If we just do first quadrant, we can use y-axis symmetry to flip into the second quadrant, and then x-axis symmetry to get the entire graph. And we graph with the clueless method. We need a very uh, good table. Good news is theta is only going from 0 to pi over 2. So there's not that many rows. That's the five theta values we need. But we do have to double our theta before we plug it in. And then we're going to cosine that. And then multiply by 4. And the approximate value, square root 3 over 2, is. Yeah, it's 0.86-ish, 1 over square root 2, 0.7 something, 7, 1. I think it's, yeah, 7, 1. And then, of course, 1 half is 0.5. That's close enough to make a graph. It's within a hundredth or two hundredths. All right, so finish this chart, and then very carefully, oh, Uh, if you solve for r, which this was not actually solved for r, how do you actually solve for r here? Square root. So it may be a little bit better to do 2 cos 2 theta. Or sorry, well, we'll leave it with 4 cos. Oh, jeez. 4 cos 2 theta, and r is plus minus square root for cos 2 theta. Unfortunately, because of that last line, you pretty much have to use a calculator at some point. All right, so fill this chart out, and it's a little weird. Graph all the positive values first, and then come back and graph all the negative values. Oh, we don't even have square root threes. That's great. Nice. So I don't need. 
to worry about decimals until the square root step. That's a neat trick. So make sure when you graph, those are not the angles you're graphing. Those are just angles to help us get the radius values. All right, pi over 4, we're at 0. So what about pi over 3 and pi over 2? They're not real numbers. So we get to not graph them as well. So we don't have to graph those two. All right, connect these together. Easy to do. Now I'm going to graph the negative versions of these radii, or radius here. So at 0, we're going to go negative 2, minus 2 at pi over 6. We're going to go negative square root 2. I'm using 1.4 for square root 2. I think that's pretty close. So there's 1 and a half, 1.4, a little less. And then back to 0 again. All right. So that already has origin symmetry right there without doing any work. So let's use symmetry now and get the rest. So yep, use x-axis symmetry. We'll get infinity, basically, or the bow tie, if you want to look sharp. OK, so any questions on the graph? No? All right, area. Now that we see symmetry, we could do half the area and then double it. But we still have the problem. Where in the world is angle? I think it's probably obvious where it ends. But where does it start? What if I filled in this chart? What if I got negative? What uh, cosine is even, so the output is going to be exactly the same as the positive version of the angle. So cosine is an even function, so this will be plus minus 2, plus minus square root 2. 
if I went to negative pi over 3, I would have not real. So that would be out and out right there. So I could go back to negative pi over 4. So we're going to go negative pi over 4 to positive pi over 4. Any questions on that idea? So that was a lot of work. That takes some time. Let's try to do this in a slightly different way. So we'll zoom in right to here. And just looking at this, r squared, because it's squared, not going to be negative. So I want to know when is this positive. So that's an alternative way to do it. I see that r squared can't be negative, so it's got to be 0 or more. So what theta values make the right side not negative or positive. And you could, again, do what we did last time, it's basically set it equal to 0, and then figure out between which solutions are we going to actually uh, use. So we're going to set 0 equal to 4 cos 2 theta, and divide by 4. So cosine 0 at pi over 2, negative pi over 2. Or I could just write pi over 2 plus, not 2 pi k, plus pi k. because each of these are separated by a rotation of pi. Would it be 2 theta is equal to that? Yeah, it sure would. So we have in here not theta, but we have 2 theta. So we solve right here for 2 theta, and then just divide everything by 2. And of course, k is any of the infinite number of integers, positive or negative. So all I have to do is pick out which k values do I want to use. I'm just going to write some k values here. We'll go with k is 0. We get pi over 4. k equals 1. And these won't be evenly spaced. k equals 1. We have 3 pi over 4. k equals 2. We have more pi's over 4, 5 pi over 4. And k equals negative 1. We have a negative pi over 4, et cetera, et cetera. All I have to do is figure out between which two of these are we going to use. So I know the right answer is those two. So let's try the wrong one. So let's try to go from pi over 4 to 3 pi over 4. How do I figure out if we're positive or negative in between? Plug in values. Plug in values. So what's a good number between pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4? 2 pi over 4. 2 pi over 4, or pi over 2. And I'm going to plug it into 4 cos 2 theta and figure out are we positive or are we negative? So this turns into cos pi. And what is cosine pi? Negative 1. So it's 4 times negative 1, negative 4. And unfortunately, that's less than 0. So between these two zeros, we are negative. That's not good. So I could test negative pi over 4 or positive pi over 4 right in between there. Well, that's a really nice number, 0. Plug that in, 2 seconds, cos 0 is 1, so we got positive 4. 
So we get plus right there. And if I do, you don't have to go any further than this, but you get minus. It actually alternates plus, minus, plus, minus, et cetera. So I could choose if I wanted to. Oh, no, wrong color. That's minus. I can choose this interval over here if I want to. I don't have to choose the first one right there. I can choose any of the positive versions. So this style should feel very similar to the last, the, the first intersection that we did. And this probably goes a lot faster. All right. So any questions on the second time through? So just practice these and uh, making a sign graph shouldn't take too long. Hopefully your solving trig equations isn't too rusty. It shouldn't be. You've had to do that quite a bit already. So you're probably OK at that. Just make sure you pick the right two values to go between. All right, where are we? An area close by. OK, so I can set up the integral close by. So as an area, so we're going to go r, dr, d theta. So easy are the theta bounds. We just spent the whole 10 minutes. Well, it's not easy to get them, but it's easy to know where to put them once you do get them, thetas. All right, what about the r bounds, little r and big r? So we said r has to, r squared has to be greater than zero. Yeah, we're gonna go zero to four cos two theta. Whoa, we have to be careful. I really should be looking somewhere else. I need to solve for r is what I need to do. Now, when you see it like this, r is between these two numbers right here. So these are the r bounds right here. So little one is a negative. And the other. Yes. Yeah. Now, if you're wondering how can r be positive and negative, well, if you think about the nice graph that we spent 10 minutes creating over here, we're going from negative pi over 4 to positive pi over 4. So your positive part of your radius traces out this area as it goes. The negative part traces out, it's a little weird, it starts at negative pi over 4, so it, but the radius is negative, so it traces out this right here in that fashion. So it kind of does both of them at the same time. Or you could go 0 to the positive version and double it. That's another option. Uh, you'll see in about 30 seconds that, that on your next step, you'll have the exact same next step, whichever way you go. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. Well, it may not be exact. It better be exactly the same. Pi over 4, pi over 4, and we get r squared over 2. So we get 1 half, and the negative. Seems like it's not going to work out. So we get 4 
cos theta minus four cos theta. I don't like that. It should not be zero. But you have to, uh, that negative, so that negative is going to get squared too. Or wait. So that's the first one is positive. So basically a square just gets rid of the square root on the positive one. But the negative one, the square turns a negative positive. So what if you try to use the negative the symmetry zero? Yeah, so I don't, this is not going to lead us to the, this is going to be zero if we keep going. So we'll go two. So it goes zero for cos two theta. Does it matter if the two is outside of the integrals or can it be uh, so we saw that constant multiple rule with, with single integrals. So basically the answer is you can move it inside this one, and then using that same rule, you can move it inside that one. So you can pass constants through as many as you want. You can do the same thing with the sum. You can break it up into the uh, sum with double integrals also. All right, this integral should be relatively easy to do. You just plug it in. I think you just get a little u sub at the end and solve it that way. But it shouldn't be a difficult integral. Yeah. It was, oh, you know what it was? All right, I know why. Because in here, on the left, r was less than 0. So that was negative area. And on the right, r was greater than 0. So at any slice, whatever slice you looked at, that little bit of area canceled every single time. Every, okay. So if you just think of the way things were sliced up, it looks like these really tiny slivers like this. But this one was all negative, and then the corresponding one on the other side was positive. So they stepped it, one at a time, were canceling each other out. Okay. So if you get zero, chances are this is happening. <laughs>